Hi, hey everybody. I'm uh, Professor Paul Constantino from the biology department for any of you that don't know me. And I am uh, hosting the meeting tonight. This is part of a, a several talks over the semester that are career conversations for the life sciences. Um, it's something that Karen Talentino was very instrumental in setting up as a way to get some of our alumni to talk to you about different careers and give you like a firsthand knowledge about what it's like to work in some of these careers but also about how they got to these careers in the first place. Um, and so today we have Haley Poulin. Haley is one of my former STAR students, uh, and she is going to talk to us today about what it's like to be a medical assistant. Um, and she works in the Burlington Community Health Centers uh, as a medical assistant. So I will let her take it from here. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Professor Constantino, and also for putting this whole thing together. I think it's really cool to connect alums with people who are in the pre-med program or just interested in healthcare. Um, so I um, am Haley, for anyone who doesn't know me. I graduated in the class of 2020, um, so pretty recently, um, and I was one of those people who really didn't know what to do after I graduated. I know you know, generally I wanted to be in healthcare, uh, but I didn't really know what experience that I could get, you know, post-graduation. So I started kind of looking online uh, through LinkedIn and um, even like a Google search is just really helpful to see what jobs are available in the area um, and what qualifications that you would need to have these jobs. Um, and a lot of them, you know, highly prefer Bachelor of Science with some sort of biological focus, um, which I think a lot of people, you know, will have here. Uh, and then some of them are accredited programs. So you needed to graduate from or get credits from some sort of, um, I guess, you know, medical assistant program, but that's not necessary for at least the health center that I work at. Um, what's really necessary is just having patient care experience um, and maybe having a physician that could write you a letter of recommendation to apply to the job. So I really didn't have any, you know, um, like certificates or, you know, certifications going into the program, which is kind of a good thing because, you know, we don't really have time to do that kind of stuff while we're in college. So um, I found the job just through an online search and I am really happy with it. So I have a PowerPoint um, and I'll share my screen with everybody. Um, can everybody see this? Okay. Oops. Okay, so um, I'll go over kind of the role of the medical assistant. I did touch on, you know, how I found the job, but I'll go into it a little bit more. Um, so medical assistants are critical in, you know, patient care and operational flow of clinics and practices, really of all specialties. Um, the really cool thing about medical assistants is that they have a very direct relationship with providers, whether that be a physician, you know, MD, DO, or a physician's assistant or nurse practitioner. Um, we work very closely with these professionals to diagnose and treat um, the patient. So a little bit more about what we do specifically. We're the people who, if you go to your doctor's office, we take you in, we'll um, perform all your vitals, including um, heart rate, blood pressure, um, sometimes we do oxygen saturation for people with pulmonary disorders. Um, we do BMI through height and weight. Um, and that's a really good indicator, you know, of where the patient's at. You know, if the patient hasn't been seen in a while, we need to know um, critical values like that. We also order any blood tests or any labs that need to be done uh, for the patient. And we actually do the, the blood draws. So when I um, first applied to the job, I had no phlebotomy experience um, and they don't, you know, you don't need it. They will train you right on the job. Um, and it's definitely one of those things that you learn and get good at just, you know, through experience. So I thought that was really cool because I know that in the career that I get in the future, it's definitely gonna be a critical um, skill to have. So I was really glad that, you know, they teach you right on the job and then you can get comfortable with it for the future. We also administer immunizations. Um, this was really popular in the fall to get the flu shot. Um, a lot of providers were really um, recommending the flu shot for people even more this year, just with COVID and going on. So um, flu shots, even routine immunizations like shingles, HPV, kind of stuff like that, we, we do those shots. And what I really like about this too is it makes you feel like you're actually involved in the patient's care. I think sometimes um, 
other positions, you know, in the medical field, you may not actually, you know, feel like you're actively involved in their treatment plan. Um, and I think the role of the MA, you actually do have a lot more involvement. Um, we also work on dictation on patients' charts, which includes an HPI, which is history of present illness centered intakes. So when we take the patient into the room, we need to know exactly when, like, let's say if they had a chronic illness, if they're managing diabetes, we need to know when they were diagnosed, how they're managing it, um, and also, you know, any hiccups in the road that they may have had. If, you know, they're not checking their blood glucose and everything like that, um, we need to make sure that the provider is aware of before they go into the room. We also need to check um, hospitalization status. So um, sometimes patients will forget to tell us that they were hospitalized in the ED for, um, I don't know, an infection a couple weeks ago and that they're still taking antibiotics. Um, so we check all this stuff before the patient goes in so that the provider knows exactly what medications that the patient is currently on and um, if they were seen elsewhere. We also um, check diagnostic history. So if a patient comes in as a new patient, we need to know what chronic illnesses they have from their um, previous practice. And we also do um, med refills. And I say limited because that's important. We for sure don't do anything with the prescribing of it. Um, but our job as a medical assistant is to review the provider's SOAP notes. And we refill cardio medications, pulmonary, uh, birth control, diabetes medications. So we'll review um, the SOAP note is the provider note essentially. So it will say, you know, continue the statin and make sure that the labs for the lipid panel are ordered by this date. Um, so we really, we go and check and read all those provider notes and make sure that um, the patient is allowed to get those meds. Um, and then we send them off to the pharmacy so that, you know, the provider doesn't get boggled down with like the little stuff, you know. Another critical role for a medical assistance is to um, check VPMS, which is the prescription monitoring service of Vermont. So if you're on a controlled substance like um, opiates or benzodiazepines, um, it's monitored by the state. So we need to know exactly when the patient picks up the controlled substance as well as where, just so that the provider is not you know, over prescribing medications and they're not potentially getting it from other sources that are not approved. And perhaps what's most critical about our job is uh, performing on-site laboratory analysis. So we can perform um, urine tests, including urinalysis, which is a good indicator if someone comes in with UTI symptoms, if they have an infection. So um, some markers that the UA detects is increased leukocyte count, which is often a marker for a UTI. Also, increased ketones could uh, indicate some sort of pre-diabetic you know, complex as well. So that's important for us to do so that the provider has that data and can properly uh, prescribe antibiotics. We also run urine drug screens. So patients coming in who are on chronic long-term opiate treatments, we need to know if they're taking their meds. So if they were prescribed morphine, we need to know if it's in their system. Um, if it's not, we have concern that they're distributing it elsewhere. And if it is, and then we also see a ton of other panels light up, we know that they're, you know, abusing substances that could impact, you know, our um, giving of like an opiate per se. We also run diabetic A1Cs, which are a good indicator of a diabetic patient's um, stability. So they test average blood glucose over a course of three months. So patients can test their blood glucose at home with a little kit, but they need to come into the office around every three months uh, because we need to perform that A1C. Uh, and it really does give the providers a good indication if the meds need to be upped or um, something else needs to be done to manage the diabetes better. We perform PTINRs for warfarin users. Um, this is specific for prothrombin time. So if a patient uh, is, has a clotting disorder or um, you know, is for some reason on warfarin, maybe they have AFib, uh, we need to monitor how quickly their blood clots every single month in order to be able to quickly adjust their uh, warfarin prescription. We don't do that. The nurses um, actually you know, adjust the prescription, but we um, do the blood test for that. We can also perform pregnancy testing. Um, the 
pregnancy testing that we do on site is much more accurate than ones that can be bought in a drugstore. Um, and you know, people come in for that quite a bit. We do rapid strep testing, but that's greatly reduced now because of COVID. Um, generally, when we have people come in with strep symptoms, they present very similar to COVID cases. So we see them at an offsite location where the providers and everything can get gowned up and protect ourselves. Um, so we're doing less strep tests, but that's something that is typically done in our office. We also do um, quite a bit more, but those are kind of just the things off the top of our, our head as far as what we do commonly. Um, so a little bit about you know how I applied. Um, obviously, I graduated. I got my Bachelor of Science. Um, mine was uh, you know major in biology, but I'm sure you know any health science fields you know chemistry would would do. Um, they really do prefer a bachelor's degree. Um, but if I obviously this probably doesn't apply to everyone, but you can apply with a high school you know diploma and then go for your medical assistant certification. Um, that's only when it would be needed. I don't. I don't think you need both. It's definitely not cumulative. It's probably one or the other. And they do highly, highly recommend you get some sort of position letter or um, which you can get from shadowing uh, or direct patient care experience that you can talk about in your interview and, you know, prove to them why, you know, you want to work with patients every day. Uh, so a little bit about where I work. Um, I am employed by the Community Health Center of Burlington, uh, and I work at the Good Health location in South Burlington. So this is a primary care office uh, and internal medicine. So some of the scope of the problems that we see in the office, uh, I alluded to this a little bit before, but we definitely treat diabetic patients, um, hypertensive patients, uh, people who have high cholesterol and you know just you know need to watch their weight. Um, that those four are generally related to each other. We also treat thyroid problems as well as pulmonary issues like asthma or COPD. I would say um, the rate of mental health problems we treat has significantly increased since COVID has happened. The rates of depression that we see in the office are much higher, um, anxiety and others. Um, we also have um, a specialist who works at our office. His name is Dr. John Brooklyn, and he was pivotal in um, creating Suboxone clinics around the state of Vermont. And he kind of has his specialty uh, opiate addiction treatment at our office with the use of Suboxone and buprenorphine. We do see some gynecological reproductive health issues, although the more complicated ones are generally referred out to GYN. And of course, um, as many of you probably know, when you go to your doctor's office for, you know, I don't know, getting into a ski accident and bumping your hip or, you know, maybe having a UTI symptom, that's all treated at the primary care office, or at least that's the first base you go to, and then they refer you out. So it's kind of a catch all, but it's typically, you know, the first spot. Um, and I'll just go over some of the cons of the job because I feel like I have to do it justice. There's cons to everything, but I will say there's not many cons um, and the pros definitely outweigh the cons. Um, and some of my you know, negatives may not be negative for you. I am currently studying to take the MCAT. So working a 40 hour week and trying to find time to study is kind of challenging for me. And I think, you know, if people are applying to grad school or, you know, PA school, taking the GRE, you'd probably experience something similar. But, you know, that's something that's more short term. And once you get done with your test, you kind of don't really have to worry about it. But it's definitely something on my mind right now is a little bit of a stressor. Um, also, I have found uh, like the longer I work in this position, the more I realize that there is a lot of administrative and insurance um, like BS in medicine that um, I don't, it's very frustrating, like seeing patients, you know, they meet with a provider and they get everything that they need to. And then they go to the pharmacy to pick up a script for, you know, whatever it be, and the script's not covered. And it's such an easy fix, but it, for some reason, insurance flags it. And, you know, even if we go back and forth and get a prior auth for the patient, for some reason, insurance just won't budge. And I think it's just really disappointing to have a system that doesn't, you know, cater to everyone and, you know, it, it's just kind of frustrating, but it is innately, you know, part of our United States health insurance system. So I think it's also good to get a glimpse into these problems so that when we go into the field, we're prepared to deal with um, situations like this. Perhaps like the most um, 
negative side of the job, I guess, is dealing with grief uh, and loss of some of the patients. For example, we work in a clinic that's primarily geriatric care. Um, so you get to know the patients really well on a personal level. Um, and sometimes, you know, you lose patients or you see them suffering from kind of chronic illnesses that you feel pretty helpless about. Um, I think the providers feel this much more because they obviously have a greater sense of responsibility in the treatment. But you feel it too because, you know, you see them every day or every time they come in and, you know, you get connected to the patients um, as well. And just really quickly, I'll run down the pros of the job. Um, it's exceptional patient care experience, very hands-on. Um, you know, you feel like you're actively involved. You learn something new every day. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, I highly value, you know, being able to learn something new because I think I'd be so incredibly bored if I never challenged myself or, you know, if three months into the job, I already knew everything that there was to know. Um, I, I don't think that it would help you grow. And I don't think that, you know, it would help you realize, you know, what you want to do in medicine. That being said, it gives you great relationships with providers. Um, so we have, you know, a variety of either physicians or PAs and Ps that work at the practice. So it kind of helped me see what differences there were between those positions and how the providers got to where they wanted to get and um, why they do what they do every day. Really sitting down and discussing that with, with the providers helped me determine um, exactly what I wanted to do in the field of healthcare, which was to become a physician. And most importantly, definitely ultimate pro of the job is the connections that you develop with the patients. Um, it's, you know, unlike anything else, it's a very special connection that I don't think um, can be matched by anything. And that's what I generally want to do with my, with my life. I want to become a physician. So I think this experience has really prepped me for um, the field that I want to go into. Any questions? That would be it. That's Thank you very much, Haley. So let's uh, open it up for anybody have any questions, feel free to shout them out. Okay. I'm just gonna stop sharing my screen too, okay. Yeah, I actually have a question. Um, how long was like your training period for this? Yes, that's a really good question. So your training period is broken up into increments. So um, I was employed, I think like my employment started in August and um, I was employed during COVID. So I think it's gonna be similar if anyone applies soon. Um, you start with all online learning the interface, the EHR system, which is very non-intuitive, um, like many EHRs are. Um, and then you slowly get acclimated to the clinic that you'll be working with and you shadow and they really, they wanna make sure that you're not thrown into the position. So I would say that the training period is around um, one month or two months before you're by yourself, you know, taking patients in. Um, and it's six months until you can start refilling meds. So, you know, they definitely don't throw you in a position and they, they make sure that you're prepared. But uh, phlebotomy starts like the first week, I think, into the job. So you're definitely, you know, hit the ground running hands on right away. Thank you. That's very helpful. Thanks. Mm -hmm. It is also paid training. It's not like, you know, so it, it, you're still having a job while you're training too, which is good. So can I ask a question with regard to your working time? So you say you have 40 hour weeks. Do you have shift work or do you have weekend work or is it just the normal working hours Monday, Friday? Yes, so um, it depends on what clinic you work at. Generally, um, a lot of the satellite locations, like one of the places that I work at is Good Health. Um, that is a satellite and that's you know pretty much nine to five every day. Um, but every other month we have to go in and do clinic work at Riverside, which is the much larger clinic. And so that's the only thing, um, you have to give up a Saturday every now and then, um, to go in in the morning and help with the providers there. I think Petra had a question. Yeah. Um, have there been any like patient encounters or anything that have made you kind of um, lean towards a specialty as a physician or has, has, how has this helped you kind of um, make any decisions there, if it has? <laughs> yes, that's a really good question. Um, I think one of the benefits of working in primary care is you do get to see such a wide scope of medicine. I kind of had an interest in orthopedics before I started working in primary care just because I, that's where I shadowed. Um, 
but I would actually say I really like the process of like diabetic management and metabolism and, and that kind of stuff. So yeah, I, I really like endocrinology. I think that's a really cool field. Um, and I think it, I don't know, the science behind it is really fascinating to me. So I would really, I like to say endocrinology would be like my final answer for, you know, what interests me the most there, but definitely not, you know, that's not like my necessarily goal for the future, but yeah, that it's good because you do get such a wide exposure to really all specialties. Haley, were there courses at St. Mike's that you feel any student wanting to go into that job should take that were really useful for you? Yes, um, anatomy and physiology, especially, um, actually, I think both anatomy and physiology courses were really useful. When we dictate, we have to use the correct terminology. So we have to know anterior, posterior, like everything in relation to the body, you do have to know. Um, you can, you know, obviously use shorthand, but when your charts are being audited, they do kind of look at, you know, the wording that you're using and if your writing is professional and anatomy and phys definitely helps with that. Talia. Um, so what if you don't have any medical experience and you're interested in this, like what would be the path to get there? Yeah, that's also a good question. I kind of was concerned about that when I was first applying to jobs because I didn't work as an LNA and I didn't have, I had a lot of shadowing experience, um, but I didn't have any like occupational experience yet. Um, what I would say maybe um, is try to get a position maybe um, as a volunteer at the hospital. I know that they are um, trying to get screeners too for the hospital that might, um, that would count as patient care. And you don't have to do that for like a long time. I think, you know, as long as you prove you've worked there for a little bit, um, that would probably count as good patient care experience. Um, they are looking, you know, for people who are comfortable around patients who, you know, you can talk to and, you know, work with the providers very well. So I think also if you can just kind of prove that in an interview, um, you would also be, you know, looking good for the job. Um, I guess I have kind of a follow up to that question. What did you do prior to applying for this job for patient care? Yes, um, I volunteered quite a bit um, when I was in high school and also in college. Um, and then I did like a hands on like shadow ship at a practice uh, in Mass General Hospital. It was an orthopedic practice. Um, I like watched surgeries and stuff and I definitely got the, the feel and the vibe of um, how patients are treated um, post-operatively in hospitals. Um, and my doctor, I was lucky to work with him because he didn't just treat it as a shadow ship. He did like literally let me, you know, it, it's up to the provider what they feel comfortable with letting you do. Um, but my shadow ship experience was very hands-on. So I was able to advocate that in my interview with Burlington Community Health Center. Um, and I got the recommendation from, from him as well. Um, so I think I found kind of a roundabout way of getting patient, you know, direct patient care experience because I think it's the most frustrating thing. They say you need such so and such years of experience, but it's just like, how are you supposed to get that if, you know, you can't get your foot in the door anywhere? Um, so I would say uh, volunteering, um, even shadowing, if you can prove, you know, you work well with providers and with patients. And how did you get your foot in the door? Did you just contact places yourself or did you use the career services office at St. Mike's at all? Or was that um, for, for my current job? No, for uh, when you were just initially starting out and you wanted some patient care experience and you looked into the shadow ship, like how did oh, you, yeah. did you just contact the hospital out of the blue or how did that work? Um, my dad is an orthopedic PA, so I got, it's just kind of about knowing the right people sometimes. Um, but that's, you know, what ultimately is beneficial about being in a, a post alumni program is, you know, you can get this from St. Mike's as well from the career center. Um, I know there's so many people who graduated from St. Mike's who work in the hospital right now as scribes or, you know, even in higher up positions that if you, um, contact the career center, I'm sure they would be able to, you know, recommend you talk to a person. And it, it it's kind of funny how far knowing people goes in, in getting opportunities like that. Um, so I, I did know someone obviously personally to get the shadow ship experience, but there's 
huge programs at a lot of the major hospitals. They may be influenced now because of COVID, but I know pre-COVID, you know, there was just an application you filled out uh, and they would set you up with a doctor at Mass General Hospital. And um, yeah, I think there, there is a formal way of going about doing it as well. Haley, I have a, a question. When you were describing <clears throat> what what things you, um, what procedures you're involved in and the kinds of interactions you have with patients, it reminded me many years ago when physician assistants first came on the horizon, they, they, they have not always been around. And it seemed to me that the, so many of the things that you talked about are things that PAs used to do, I think, but now you can, I guess I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the role that a PA plays now and a nurse practitioner in mm -hmm. relation to, to the work that you do. Yes, um, that's a good question. There is absolutely no practical difference. This is my opinion, so not textbook, but there's no practical def like difference between an NP, a PA, and a physician when it comes to primary care. Like they can do absolutely anything that a, a doctor can do. Um, you know, they just have a different degree. Some of them have different specialties. So I think um, a lot of the work that I do has allowed, let's say, PAs or NPs to free up time that can be better. They're obviously, they have degrees. They're way more skilled right. than we are. They have way more knowledge about, you know, um, chronic illness and whatever. Um, it frees up them to, you know, take a higher position of patient care. So, you know, a lot of the stuff, if we didn't, if we weren't there at the facility, I think, you know, they would be able to see much less patients. Um, and, you know, just generally things would run a little bit like less smoothly. So we really free up a lot of the time for providers just so that everyone, oh, bye Ruth. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so I think we allow them to take a uh, higher executive role like they should be doing and actually, you know, treating the patient. Interesting. My, my other question um, is about the role of um, organizations like Community Health. I mean, as you and I were talking about earlier, Good health used to be just a single practice, right? A private practice. Right. And at some point they made the decision that they were going to become incorporated into this larger um, organization. And do you, I wonder, of course you don't know what it was like when it was just a, a single a single private practice, but I wonder about pros and cons when you're part of a larger organization as opposed to a private practice. Um, I would say like one pro right off the bat, um, is having a larger human resources department that you can be more reliable on. So mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I think there's a lot of like safeguards that um, bigger organizations provide to their employees. Um, I know that we have more benefits now that we didn't have earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's also cons with a bigger chain of um, you know com people. Yeah, I think in general, um, we get audited quite more or more frequently because there are people whose job it literally is to review our charts um, <laughs> and to make sure that they're up to the, the standard of the organization. So, yeah. I, I mean, I guess that's a con, but ultimately it does keep us accountable too and making sure that we're, you know, treating people with the care that the company represents. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I think that those are good. That makes sense. And Haley, I, you gave us a great overview of all the different things you do, but I guess what I'm still a little fuzzy on is like, what's your day-to-day -day like? Do you follow a particular doctor around every day or a particular nurse, or do you jump from one to another? How does that work? Yes, also a good question. Um, at my practice, at least, everyone is assigned to a physician or a provider. Um, I work with Dr. Lauren Terrio. Um, she generally has some subspecialties that you know patients like to go see her because she is one of the only females. So a lot of GYN patients come in and see her um, as opposed to some of the other providers. Um, so we are assigned, whenever that provider's there, their medical assistant will be working with them. Um, and that's why you develop like such a good connectivity with them. But um, I most certainly, I've worked with everyone else at the practice as well, just because of the high demand. And it's so crazy right now, as far as busyness and everything that we do have floats. So if you are floating that day, you will be likely working with 
multiple providers. Um, and it's kind of interesting because you get used to their style too. Um, some people, you know, want you to get a lot more information from the patient and some people want you to get in and out so that they can get in as quickly as they can kind of thing. So yeah, I guess to answer your question, like we are assigned to a physician uh, or a provider, but um, we do get, like I work with a lot of the NPs there as well, um, which is kind of beneficial because it helped me decide whether I did want to become a physician or an NP or a PA kind of thing. So it sounds like it's not only giving you a huge range of experience, but it's also potentially setting you up for some really nice letters of recommendation because you get to work really closely with people for over a long period of time. Yes, that's for sure. Yep. I would highly recommend it to anyone who's going to like post-professional programs. Like if you want to go to PA school or um, med school, you are going to need uh, physicians letters of recommendation or PA recommendation letters. Um, and actually uh, a plug, one of the NPs that work at Good Health, her name is Jennifer Laurent, and she runs the nurse practitioner program at UVM. So if you get to know her, it's kind of one of those things like it's a good in to have with people who have a lot of pull in programs you may want to be a part of or go to kind of thing. I have one more question and that is, what is it that made you decide to become a physician rather than a nurse practitioner or a PA? I think the role of the physician is, is unique in a sense. Um, well, PA is actually a relatively like new um, position. My dad was one of the first classes of physician's assistants and not a lot of people really knew what a PA was, but now they're more distinguished. So um, PAs are typically it depends on the specialty, but they're typically more patient care centered than a physician. So the physician that I work with, Dr. Lauren Terrio, is highly involved in research as well as patient care. And I think that the role of the physician lends quite well to that. Um, uh, you're, you know, I think there's certain uh, requirements where you have to publish, I, there's something in the fellowship agreement of a physician where you have to be involved somehow in research. And I, absolutely love doing research. I think, um, well, I did some of it with Ruth Fabian Fine earlier um, in my college career. And I think, I don't know, the role of researching illness and pathology interests me just as much as the role of patient care and the role of the physician lends better to that than PA or NP. So you mentioned as a con, one of the things was having to work 40 hours a week can prepare for med school in the MCATs. Uh, is this a job you could do part-time or because you're attached to a doctor, do you, is it, do you have to be a full-time employee? So at my location, they're only looking for full-time employees. Um, but at Riverside, I know a lot of people work per diem. Um, so they, I think there's 30 hour weeks, there's um, even 15 hour weeks where you're kind of just on call. Uh, so it, it you do have some flexibility there. Uh, it also depends on if they're hiring right now. Um, that can be, you know, checked with the um, HR department on the website. But I do know that at Riverside, there's more P per DM positions uh, than full time. Interesting. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, Talia, go ahead. Um, so in your case, like at the clinic you're like you went to, they were just looking for you to have some sort of experience. Do you know of other clinics that like you have to have a certification for? So like, is there one like path that's better to go or? Yes, um, at, I applied to a, a couple places um, at UVM. Uh, I forget what specialties they were. I think one of them was actually endocrinology. Um, like they're huge massive departments where I'm pretty sure, I, know, I don't know, UVM employees have told me this, that on LinkedIn, they filter out applications that don't already, you're not already working at UVM. So I'm pretty sure all my applications didn't even make it through to the second round with departments like that, because I didn't have the initial, I wasn't applying from the internal system, I was applying as an outsider trying to get those jobs. Um, but all of those jobs were also you have to have some sort of certification and a year's worth of experience. That's not the case for the community health center. I think it's much more, can you prove that you would be good in a job like this? Um, and I think primarily, I wouldn't say that we're 
relaxed about it, but we need people like right now, especially during COVID. So I think you're kind of on the ben the good side of it where, you know, as long as you can show them or have some sort of, you know, whether it be volunteerism or, um, oh, actually, I just thought of this, sorry, different train of thought. Something that I did um, for a couple years was I worked for Hope Works, which is a sexual abuse and domestic abuse hotline. So that was actually a huge part of my patient care experience because we would answer calls from the hotline and um, oftentimes it was, you know, working through with the people who called some of the problems and dealing with a lot of the emotional, um, emotional struggles of those people. So I talked about that in my interview and I think as long as you do have experiences like that, um, where you prove that you have empathy and, you know, good patient care, you know, relations and stuff, that, that really does help. Um, and that wasn't like, I didn't need a certification to do that. Um, if that's something that you're interested in as well, it's a good way to get patient care experience without having a degree or needing some sort of accreditation. Um, it's uh, Hope Works. I, they do some sort of presentation at St. Mike's too, I think, for freshmen. Mm -hmm. um, it's a great organization. It's completely nonprofit. Um, and it's, you know, you just have to take their course to get trained, which I think is like a week long. And then, you know, you're, you're in it. You can take calls and whatnot. So it's definitely, I would highly recommend that too for anyone who's interested. And I'll also just mention that working at a hospice house, they often take volunteers with no experience and that can be sort of good first experience because it shows you have empathy and that you, I mean, you're seeing patients that they're most vulnerable. So um, a lot of doc hospitals and um, primary care places really like that type of experience as well. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about HopeWorks or organizations like that is I suspect they're doing a lot of their work virtually now. So that might be something you could, you know, do um, on a schedule that would allow you to do it while you're still in school, even if you just do it for a few hours a week. I think you're right. Yeah. That sort of demonstrates that compassion and empathy. What, one other one final question that I had um, was, what is the medical assistant certification process like? Do you know what it involves? Yes, um, I think it's a year long course and then you have to take an exam at the end of it. Um, it's, it's generally for people who have not graduated with a bachelor's degree, um, okay. who are coming right out of college. Um, at the practice that I shadowed at, I spoke with a medical assistant there and that's what she did. It was a completely online course, but I think it was six months to a whole year. And then you take your exam and if you don't pass your exam, you don't get the certification. So having a bachelor of science in some sort of a biology related field proves that you can do comparable work to someone who has that credibility. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Haley? This has been fantastic, Haley. All right, in that case, I wanna thank Haley very much. What a fantastic session. <laughs> I learned, I think, just as much as anybody else here. That was great. Oh, thank you. <laughs> They're good questions for everyone too. I think everyone's like really focused on the right thing and asking the right questions to, for your next steps after graduation. And uh, while you're here, let me remind everybody that our next uh, conversation is coming up on Tuesday with Mindy Goodrum from the class of uh, uh, 18, it says. And she uh, is in environmental management. She's a project manager at York County Soil and Water Conservation District. So um, we're going to be hearing from her at 6 p.m. on the 9th. Um, so again, thanks very much, Haley. And thank you guys all for coming. I hope it was useful for you.